This is for the chapter 12 weekly debrief for liabilities. So a number of our questions from the FAQs this week came from the CPA Way Chapter 12 question and solution debrief. Maximum two sentences with assess the situation. So here, when we assess the situation, we're looking at an overall summary. You can do that in form of a question or you can do that in the form of a statement. The key parts here is that you need to capture the financial accounting, financial reporting issue, as well as the case fact with it. So again, in the form of a question, in the form of a statement, maximum two sentences, typically this will be perhaps double of what you actually need to accomplish this. We've had a number of great questions when it has to do with analyze major issues. A number of students asked if it was okay to use the definition of a liability or if we must use the criteria here. And so either or would have been appropriate because uh, they'll get you to the same place. And then some people asked, well, what was the criteria here? And this is paraphrased from the ASPE section 3110 for asset retirement obligation. So again, they don't conflict. They both get you to the same place. And because we touched on one during the week, I thought I'd show you the other one. The application is the same. You wanna have your criterion. I like to bold it. Then apply your case fact and then clearly say if it was met or not met, um, stating why. So for our, our analyze the major issue, we were going to kind of come out with a very similar analysis. Again, the point of the CPA way questions is really to show you that it's about the process and not necessarily about the outcome, as you'll see in the next part. For conclude, the number one FAQ that um, that you guys asked me was, <laughs> sorry, Bambi's caller in the background, and um, this is her helping, was where did this 6% come from? So this 6% was, um, was an estimate. It was used as an assumption, typically anywhere between sort of 5 and 10%, unless you're given uh, significant case facts to say whether it's a particularly low risk entity, in which case you'd want to go down to maybe, I wouldn't go any lower than two, I wouldn't go any lower than kind of like our baseline inflation um, or four. Or if it's really high risk, you know, going 15, 20, kind of thinking like credit card risk areas. But right now in the current economic climate, you're pretty much good with assuming a rate between 5 and 10%. Uh, sometimes students ask me or CPA candidates will ask me, can I use a range? But I'm like, okay, if you use a range, then you're going to have to calculate two numbers and then you run yourself the risk of not coming up with one solid recommendation. So state your assumptions, calculate consistently, uh, conclude consistently, advise consistently. Um, worst, worst, worst scenario is say there was a percentage up here. Say there was a 6% hidden or an 8% that you should have used. If you state an assumption or make an assumption and it's wrong, at worst, you'll get dinged once. But as long as you are consistent throughout, you are good to go. I threw this in here not to be, not to play tricks, but uh, just to show you inherently that if you have all the information, um, great. But perhaps you have information, but you don't have all the information. What the heck do you do? Now, we are in a safe learning environment. This is a completion assignment, as they all are, and the purpose is to apply, learn, question, debrief, and ask the questions. And I'm so super thrilled that a number of you put this in your debrief videos, and a number of you actually emailed me uh, and, and demanded to know where it was, um, even before the deadline, which I thought was pretty cool. Somebody else asked me why uh, the six out of 12 months, and that has to do with the fact that here um, we entered into um, the um, the tanker, and then here we had to uh, figure out for the accounting. <clears throat> excuse me, as at uh, December thirty first. So at the end of the first year, can you please tell me um, what the accretion entry is? So I say accretion because one of the key differences that we'll focus on for this course and that CPA focuses on is that um, the two main differences between IFRS and ASPE is under ASPE, we refer to this entry as accretion. Under IFRS, we refer to it as financing charges. So, and with that, accretion shows up under the statement of operations for cash flow. And financing falls under the investing section. So just something to keep an eye out for. So how do we get that number? We get that by timesing 
the interest rate that we've assumed and used to discount our future obligation. So I'll even I'll wind it even further back. Number of candidate or students, pardon me, asked me where we got this 41879. And I'll flash up on the screen that that is the present value of this 75,000. So in 10 years, uh, we are estimating, or it has been estimated by our company's engineering team that will cost us 75,000 to remove these underground storage tanks and you know make this pretty again. Um, so we need to discount this to the present value, which if we assumed a 6% interest rate, would be 41,879 times by our interest rate and then times by the number of months until year end. If you assumed that their year end was, you know, maybe you assumed it was June 30th, cool. You know, state your assumptions, do your calculations, um, and conclude accordingly. When given no other information, you need to state your assumptions and calculate accordingly. Okay, and now advise. When looking here, we were asked to advise our users. So what happens if we're gonna go public? You know, there's different sets of rules as far as asset to retirement obligations. What's the main difference? We talked about one, accretion versus financing costs or expenses. And we have a few different differences. Um, some are listed here. Uh, we also have the difference uh, that was discussed in our slides, in our chapter 12 slides, our part one, um, slides was that the um, the financing expenses must be used uh, using the effective interest rate, calculated using the effective interest rate, whereas under ASPE, we can use the effective interest rate method or we can use straight line methods. So just take the difference between the future value of costs and the present value, take that difference and divide it by the number of years in of the useful life of that asset and then we can just expense it. So debit our accretion expense and credit our asset retirement obligation using that straight line method. So either or. One of our questions this week came from the slides. So the topic two, common liability slides, specifically number eight. And the question was, in the warranty example, why do we need to add the 5% and the 2% when calculating the warranty expense and liability? So the reason why we use the 2% and the 5% is because that's what we are estimating the warranty expense to be. So that is what we need to book as our warranty expense when we sell these. So we need to match our expenses for warranties uh, to the product that they're tied to. As such, as soon as we made the sales, which we assumed here that we're making cash sales, we need to book the warranty expense. So yes, in year one, based on past experience, 2% of the sales that we made are going to come back in warranty costs for uh, this 450000 in the first year. And then, because it's a two-year warranty, then these $450,000 worth of sales, they're gonna come back and actually cost 5% worth of their sales for a total of 7%. 7% 7 of this 450,000 over the two years of the warranty are gonna come back. So as such, we need to book $31,500 worth of warranty expenses for 2020. But you say, Sam, um, you have 16,500 here, not 31,500, which would be the 7%. And I would say, aha, the difference is the actual warranty expenditures. So already booked throughout this was the actual warranty expenditures. So somebody had already debited warranty expenses by 15,000 and credited cash or salaries payable, they've already credited something, but it wasn't the warranty liability. The number that we are curious about is, hey, what is our warranty liability specific to these sales, this 450,000, understanding that we're gonna incur 2% of their warranty costs in this year and 5% likely next year. Uh, I've had some really interesting questions that came up. So they had to do a CPA way question, uh, which each week is like one financial reporting issue for a case. Okay. 
So it's like a case, but like a third of it kind of thing. And they go through and they assess and they analyze and they conclude and they advise. And uh, one student this week asked me how much money they could make from answering questions like this. So what do you think? I would like to know your thoughts. How much? <laughs> For it to be marking a case, uh, we uh, CPA Canada pays their their markers an average of sixty five dollars an hour to mark a case. Um, nothing to write it, um, but uh, but sixty five an hour to mark it. Or uh, if this was a consulting client and this was an actual client that you're helping out, um, you can charge anywhere from I don't know maybe. $40, $50 an hour up into several hundreds, uh, if not on a project base, to, to solve this and, and get stuff done. So really, your value as an accountant uh, is limitless. Um, but right right now... <laughs> I think that was the correct answer. <laughs> I apologize for getting nitty gritty, but I actually think this hits on something that you and I see in CPA a lot. Okay. So, they, a company violates a covenant. Um, but it's, it's just by a little bit, Caitlin. Is that, is that like a super, is that like, that's not as bad as violating it by a law, right? <laughs> why, why are you laughing? You can't be a little bit pregnant. No, that's such a good one. <laughs> it's violated or it's not. And if it's violated, yeah, you have to put that whole shebang as current. You have to pay it back. You have to figure out like how to pay it back. You need to contact them and unless you get a waiver that 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 is going on your financial statements as current and it might trigger other things it might Absolutely. um yeah it's it's no good even if it's just a little bit these students are thinking about integration already and we are in the first or second week of uh intermediate financial accounting to um the first week of their fourth year i am both challenge fulfilled and happy with everything that I work on and feeling like I accomplished something that impacted more than just me. Love it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'll turn off the camera. All right, so as you see me on the screen right there and see my fancy little microphone, uh, that was new because I thought that, yep, yeah, pointed out, I wanted to get some better audio quality for you. The thing is, you actually need to turn it on in order for it to work. So I spent uh, a decent amount of time letting you know about my a day and letting you know that I volunteered to assess boot camp participants from the Princess Trust and that the organizer was kind enough to drop off a mug. So I'm showing you that here. It was a great organization to be a part of and that's why this video is coming to you um, a little bit later than I'd like. Not later than I said, but later than I'd like. Um, I discussed in this video a few of the provision answers and questions that came up. Um, most notably, a few people asked me about legal expenses uh, and some people were mixing up contingent asset, which you would have seen likely in IFA 1, with a contingent liability or provision. So take into consideration uh, those two different definitions. Uh, a number of people asked about uh, about uh, different IFRS versus ASPE. So I'm going to link a resource down below. Uh, again, yes, please support our veterans. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. The Prince's Trust supports veterans that are coming out of the military, or I guess soon to be veterans that are coming out of the military and transitioning to civilian life. Uh, so with supporting them with their entrepreneurial efforts and I was really proud to be supporting DAL, pardon me, representing DAL and specifically the accounting department. Okay, so items that I discussed here, and I specifically talked about them and said that I was going to link below, was I had a few students ask me about the different differences between IFRS and ASPE. So other than the ones that I noted earlier in this video, uh, they are not examinable. But for those of you that want to dig in, there are a ton, and you'll see a few more in CPA, and uh, throughout your career, you'll see even more. Um, there were a few questions about what do we have to do in order to transition from ASPE to IFRS. So you will need to get your past statements audited and it must be audited the moment that you go um, public and this is you know, venture specific. 
and I'll link down some information below, but what is recommended is you have those financial statements audited beforehand. And of course, all of your financial statements and comparative statements and opening balances need to be in IFRS. So again, it is recommended that those are audited um, prior to going public because as many of you know, audits can be stressful and they can require a lot of details. So it's important to get that um, kind of in line before you add on the extra layers of going public. I loved going through all of your videos. I loved seeing you. A number of you guys said, I started your videos with like, hello, Samantha. A um, number of you said nice things about the videos the weekly slide videos uh, and the materials. So thank you. I really appreciate your kind, appreciate your kind words. Uh, Bryce, Nicole, and I, um, you know, we've really put a lot of thought and attention to this. Uh, that being said, always looking for your feedback and looking to support you. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, as you can tell with my editing skills, it is a work in process, but I'm looking forward to getting better and I hope you have a great day and I will see you in the next video via email, via Canley office hours, and I hope you have a lovely night.